Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this uh, 42nd annual Mercy Douglas Lectureship and Magruder Knox Scholarship Award Ceremony. I, it is my great honor to welcome you um, to this event. There are many more people who may be joining us. And you know, we are here today excited, but also that is somewhat tempered um, by us missing someone who uh, really helped this event so special and dear to their heart. I am uh, Sophia Shabazz. I serve as president of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania. And I want to thank our gracious hosts and uh, co-sponsors of this event, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, Jack Sidney Kimmel Medical College, and the um, Sidney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson. And with that, I want to bring on the interim co-CEO of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, Dr. Daniel Dempsey. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shabazz. And uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Julia Pallor, our board chair here at the college, who's here with us tonight, and my other co-CEOs, Dr. Carolyn Asbury and Dr. Sankey Williams, who's not able to be here, uh, I wanted to welcome you all to the College of Physicians. And uh, we're, we're, we're pleased to co-sponsor tonight along with uh, Medical Society of Eastern PA and the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in Jefferson, the uh, Mercy Douglas uh, Lecture. Uh, this lecture was established to celebrate the Mercy Douglas Hospital and its contributions to black health care in the city of Philadelphia. Now, many of you probably know this college here was founded in 1787 to lessen human misery and uh, continues a very active and dynamic place today. Uh, with a mission of advancing the cause of health while upholding the ideals of medicine. Today, the College of Physicians has grown to over 1,100 physicians and community and healthcare leaders. It's the home of the uh, Mutter Museum, of the Historical Medical Library, the History of Vaccines website, and the Center for Public Health. The college also has many youth programs aimed at high school students from disadvantaged communities, uh, women of the African diaspora, and LGBTQ youth, and it focuses on encouraging an interest in STEM education with the goal of diversifying the healthcare workforce. Our newest student program, the Hinks and Holloway Mentorship Program, focuses on mentoring young black men interested in careers in medicine and healthcare. It is named in honor of the first two black fellows of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, Drs. Kingston and Holloway, who became fellows of the college in October of 1952. They were prominent physicians in Philadelphia who made significant contributions to medicine uh, while breaking down racial barriers within the profession of medicine. Additionally, in the lobby, you will find a small exhibition containing a portrait of Dr. Mosell and the charter of the Mercy Douglas Lecture. Uh, so we're very happy that you're here with us tonight. Uh, if this is your first time at the College of Physicians, we do hope you'll come back uh, and visit us. Uh, and uh, now, without further ado, I want to welcome to the podium Dr. Anna Marie Lopez, uh, who is a professor uh, and vice chair of medical oncology at the Sidney Kimmel Jefferson Medical School Chief of Cancer Services at the Sidney Kimmel Cancer Center, Dr. Lopez. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Sidney Kimmel Cancer Center and uh, really an amazing partnership with the College of Physicians to uh, celebrate our history and uh, the long-term partnership. 
Um, I did want to start because uh, those of you who have come before are probably used to this welcome coming from our great friend, uh, Dr. Edith Mitchell. And uh, those of you who know uh, Dr. Mitchell know that she was a force of nature. Uh, she uh, was a leader, a pioneer, and really uh, many of us would not be here today if not for her leadership. And uh, what I like to think of as stick to witness, you know? You gotta show up and show up and show up yet again. So I did want to start with um, just a small moment, if we could, of silence, remembrance, where we can keep Dr. Mitchell close to our heart as we begin this session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity to be with you and for the partnership with the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. Um, it's also my great privilege to introduce uh, a colleague and um, a woman who has worked with Dr. Mitchell and has worked at the Cancer Center for 23 years. She is a reverend doctor. And as much as her work has impacted cancer health disparities, supported cancer health equity, Dr. Charmaine Green has impacted mind, body, and spirit. Dr. Green. For this opportunity to stand before you, and I thank Dr. Shabazz for this opportunity to share and to remember my buddy, my friend for 21 years, for 23 years, as we crisscrossed the United States giving programs and addressing disparities and teaching members of every region of the National Medical Association in healthcare disparities. So I've been asked to give the invitation. So I'm putting on my collar, as Dr. Shabazz asked, and provide the invitation. So if you are able, I'm going to ask if you would please stand. Father God, our creator, as we gather this evening, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, and most of all, we thank you for protection. As we gather this evening, we also thank you for those who are blessed with wisdom to establish the Mercy Douglas Hospital. We are thank you for their labors of love, their dedication to the community, and their training of physicians and nurses, works that continue to impact our lives today. During this time of celebration, we pay tribute to those individuals who are no longer with us, but whose presence will always be felt amongst us. We pay tribute to those individuals who forged the pathways for us to gather today for this occasion. Those individuals who shared their gifts to improve the health and wellness of our communities. During this time of celebration, we pay tribute to those individuals whose shoulders we stand upon as we continue the work that begun so long ago. God, I pray that you continue to bless the works of the entities gathered to celebrate, continue to bless the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania, Jefferson's Kidney, Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, and the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I pray that their works continue to benefit the residents of our city, just as the Mercy Douglas Hospital blessed our city in the past. These thanks and prayers we lay before you and ask that you continue to bless our works, continue to bless this day, and to continue to bless this annual gathering. These things we pray, and as everyone gathered today, I ask you to say amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Greedy. And with that, I uh, want to 
bring on our uh, next speaker who will give us um, an overview of the history of the Mercy Douglas Hospital. And the person who was invited to present this portion of the program is a scholar in one of our newest programs of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania, the MSCP Impact Prep Scholars Program. We established this program um, because we recognize that one of the major hurdles or barriers to medical school admission for many black students is to get a um, competitive score in the medical college admissions test. And I know that many, many, many years ago when I applied to medical school, the prep programs for uh, the tests were quite expensive and they haven't gotten any less expensive now, which creates you know, an additional disparity for those uh, who cannot afford it. So this student was invited because he had spent the most hours uh, amongst his peers doing practice programs and studying in preparation for the MCAT, um, hopefully this coming uh, spring. So without further ado, I want to introduce Chikoze Ibe. And thank you, Dr. Shabazz, for the wonderful introduction. <clears throat> Since 1982, the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania has celebrated the legacy of the Douglas, Mercy, and Mercy Douglas Hospitals with the annual Mercy Douglas Lectureship. The catalyst for the founding of these hospitals was the same as that which sparked the establishment of our parent organization, the National Medical Association. Exclusion from white professional spaces on the order of race. Just a few generations removed from the abolition of slavery, black Americans in the late 1800s experienced an expansion in opportunities to seek higher education, albeit an expansion from the ground floor. While pathways into higher education began to tether the line between fantasy and reality, the educational and professional pipeline in medicine was clogged by a major obstacle, the child of slavery commonly referred to as systemic racism. African-American medical school graduates were refused internship, residency, and full access to education and professional opportunities, perpetuating disadvantages that communities that would likely be served by these aspiring professionals were already experienced. The Mercy Douglas Hospital originated from the Frederick Douglas Hospital, founded by Dr. Nathan F. Mosell. In 1882, Dr. Mosell became the first African American graduate from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Astonishingly, or unfortunately, not very much so, Dr. Mosell was denied the opportunity to complete his residency at the University Hospital due to his ascribed status as a black man, despite his achieved status as a medical graduate at the top of his class. This led him to journey across the Atlantic Ocean to London, where he would work at multiple hospitals, and ultimately, this would lead to his return to Philadelphia with reinvigorated inspiration to serve the disenfranchised people of his community. He founded the Frederick Douglass Hospital, Memorial Hospital and Training School, Philadelphia's first black hospital in 1895 in a three-story building at 1512 Lombard Street. This institution not only provided black Americans with proper medical treatment, but its doors were open to enlist the interest and support of all philanthropic people, providing access to training and career opportunities in nursing and medicine to all who are willing to serve the community, granted just about all of its patients and staff were black. In the years leading to up to 1907, up and coming young physicians began to work with Dr. Mosell at the Douglas Hospital. Among those were Dr. Eugene Henson, the second black graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and Dr. Henry McKee May, co founder of the Bolet, also known as Sigma Pi Phi, the first black Greek letter fraternity. In 1907, along with several other physicians to satisfy with the leadership of Douglas Hospital. These men opened the doors of Mercy Hospital and School of Nurses, which shared a similar mission of providing access, training, 
professional opportunities to Philadelphia's black community. Unfortunately, Douglas and Mercy Hospital struggled with financial difficulties that were in large part related to serving patients who did not have the ability to pay. In an effort to preserve both hospitals, Douglas Hospital merged with Mercy Hospital in 1948 to form the Mercy Douglas Hospital in West Philadelphia. The combined entity continued to provide healthcare, careers, and training to thousands of individuals until it closed in 1973. Now, as today marks the 42nd year since the establishment of the annual Mercy Douglas Lectureship, we are charged with the mission of the esteemed College of Physicians to advance the cause of health while upholding the ideals and heritage of medicine. As Black Americans occupying a social stratum that we were once ostracized from, our charge is to create our own heritage in medicine and to build on a history in medicine of people who look like us, who talk like us, and who think like us, to advance the effectiveness of healthcare in our communities, and to educate our people on health disparities and lifestyle changes that can lead to better health outcomes. Our charge is to bridge the gap between patient and physician by understanding the ideals that govern the lives of those who seek care, while upholding the ideals of medicine that lessen human misery. Thank you so much for your time. In the face of Jim Crow and overwhelming odds, many African-American physicians and nurses were still able to obtain a medical education. Due to the color of their skin, many were denied residency training or staff privileges to provide the highest quality of care to the African-American population that they served. In the year 1895, the year of Frederick Douglass' death, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital was established by Dr. Nathan F. Moselle at 1512 Lombard Street. Dr. Moselle, an 1882 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, was refused an internship to the University Hospital despite his recorded exceptional academic accomplishment. Because of the racial politics of that time, he completed his training in England and returned afterwards to Philadelphia. By 1900, roughly 40 black hospitals were established in the United States. Between 1891 to 1902, there were 10 black nursing schools, and by 1930, nearly 200 black hospitals were built. In 1948, the Frederick Douglass Hospital merged with Mercy Hospital, another prominent black hospital to form the Mercy Douglass Hospital. Leading off with the fact that I was very proud of that hospital and the doctors that served the community. Uh, it wasn't an elitist thing at all, but well-trained, giving doctors. And the fact that not only they gave to the community, but they gave to each other, and that was a very pleasurable part of my experience with them. The little informal gatherings in the hall, and Dr. Edward Holloway, who always seemed to be the uh, chief speaker, so to speak, we all listened to him. He knew more about, he was an internist, but he knew more about pediatrics than I did, and I was a pediatrician. Exceptional person, but point being that he sort of gathered us together uh, pull things out of us that perhaps we didn't know we knew and so we all learned from each other and that was one of the best parts of being on that hospital staff. In other hospitals that I belong to you walk by and say hi there and you're going on. Uh, at Mercy Douglas Hospital it was almost a continuous learning procedure. Despite the fact that we were in the shadow of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and that shadow stayed there for the most part, that we were able to fight our way through it and above it. Coming from Washington and having had some of my training in Freedman's Hospital, which also was a black hospital, even though associated with Howard University, uh, it still was a black hospital in a segregated city. So uh, I was sort of already marinated, so to speak, to be able to work in those conditions, but at the same time, not accept them, but to continue to try to break through those barriers and to be on an equal, and in many cases, above 
the normal in terms of degree of the medical services that were available and were given freely. I got into graduate school at Howard University and I was going to, you know, go into zoology. I had a project, the, the vitamin E effect on a six-week-old chick embryo and some little crazy stuff like that. And that that's the direction I was going. Uh, one day I'm in the <clears throat> laboratory and I'm just sitting around looking through the microscope at egg yolk and all that stuff and feeling very discontent, but Dr. Drew walked by and he was always curious if he saw someone in a study situation. And so he poked his head in, uh, he just called me Gaskins. Uh, what are you doing there, Gaskins? Uh, and of course I came straight to attention. Dr. Drew was an icon. And so uh, I said, well, Dr. Drew, I'm working on a project for, for my bachelor's degree. And he said, well, tell me about it. I said that the effect of vitamin E on the six-week-old chick embryo. And the minute I said it, I said, that is a stupid sounding thing to be doing. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden he looked at me in a way like he felt it was too. <laughs> and uh, he looked in the microscope uh, because he was very curious intellectually. And he said, well, good luck. And when he got to the door, he turned around, he looked at me and he says, I believe I heard uh, in the registration department that there was one more opening in the freshman medical school class. And out he went. I said to myself, why did they tell me that? And it was like one of those light bulbs that you see going on so that you start thinking clearly. I said, he was trying to tell me something. <clears throat> and the next day I went to the medical school registration and said, listen, do you have any openings in the freshman class? One last opening. And, bring us some credentials and we'll see what we can do. And so within three days, I was registered as a freshman in medical school. When I think of Dr. Lorenzo Walker, I think of someone that I have admired for years for many reasons. <clears throat> Personally, a, a, a person that was friendly, giving, uh, and uh, quietly intelligent. Uh, he assumed a position uh, almost uh, single-handedly of publishing uh, a magazine which uh, became uh, much sought after by local physicians and later we found out that that magazine was looked at as far as California. Uh, he uh, was very modest about it but very thorough about it and even today I consider him among my closest and most admired friends. This particular procedure which was called exchange transfusion had just been more or less successfully developed in Boston. It was uh, something that kind of elevated me in a way above just office pediatrics. And uh, a number of exchange transfusions were successfully done. And uh, I even wrote an article that appeared in the Journal of Pediatrics concerning it. I did not originate, it's just that I was taught how to do it. And I uh, was able to bring it into Mercy Douglas Hospital where it had not been done before, and it uh, was received quite well. That's one of my fond memories of my professional exchanges, so to speak. And when I look back on it, I'm proud that I was those doctors that I can remember that gave the best possible care and when unrecognized, uh, were still able to be able to give everything that they had learned and been taught so that the community, particularly the community of color uh, receive care equal to that of any hospital in the city.
was equally impactful every time I've seen it. So without further ado, I have the great honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, the president of the American Medical Association. Dr. Ehrenfeld was inaugurated as president of the AMA in June 2023. He is a senior associate dean, tenured professor of anesthesiology, and director of the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He was elected to the American Medical Association Board of Trustees in 2014. Dr. Ehrenfeld divides his time among clinical practice, teaching, research, and directing a $560 million statewide health philanthropy. He also has an appointment as an adjunct professor of anesthesiology and health policy at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and as an adjunct professor of surgery in the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Eric Feld is a consultant to the World Health Organization Digital Health Techno Technical Advisory Group and previously served as co-chair of the Navy Surgeon General's Task Force on Personalized and Digital Medicine as a special advisor to the 20th U.S. Surgeon General. Dr. Aaron Feld's research, which focuses on understanding how information technology can improve surgical safety and patient outcomes, has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, and the Foundation for Anesthesia Education and Research. He currently serves as on the National Academy of Medicine's Health Policy Fellowships and Leadership Programs Advisory Committee. Thank you, Dr. Ehrenfeld, for uh, gracing us with your presence, and we look forward to your presentation. It is truly an honor to be here tonight. You know, when Dr. Mitchell called me a few months back and um, invited me to spend the evening to give this lecture, those of you who knew her knew exactly what went through my head, which was, even though I had something else I was supposed to do, the answer was, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then I'm gonna figure out how to do it. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of a hard time for those of us who knew her, but also such an important moment to reflect on the legacy that she has left behind. She, um, was a role model, a trailblazer, a pioneer, a veteran, a two-star general. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But most importantly, she was just a dear friend. And, um, you know, she showed up at the AMA at a time when she was not always welcome, and she knew that. And I also showed up at the AMA as a gay man at a time when I was not always welcome. And I knew that. And um, in many ways, we could not have been more different people. But in other ways, we shared a lot in common, including our military service and our passion for health equity in the underserved communities. So um, she was such a strong supporter of transforming the AMA and using the power of the AMA to transform healthcare that she continued to encourage me and others to show up and to drive the change. And when I think about all of that work, all of the work that she did in speaking out against racial justice, uh, health inequities, working to solve them, um, I could not be more proud of what she has accomplished and being here in this room tonight is, is clearly up to that. So, I thought I would dedicate my remarks this evening to Dr. Mitchell's memory and her courageous work, but also to the hundreds of physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers from Mercy Douglas Hospital who serve this community tirelessly with such compassion, who provided educational opportunities for black physicians and nurses at a time when there was nowhere else to go decades before the unfortunate closure in 1973. Um, 
And of course, we're here as we celebrate Black History Month uh, and all the pioneering black physicians and nurses and scientists who have advanced the cause of social justice throughout history. So uh, it is a, an honor to, to be here tonight and to deliver this, uh, this lecture. So um, thank you for that very lovely, kind introduction. Um, this is my 90-something uh, you know, page CD uh, on a slide. Um, and most of my work in anesthesia and informatics has been about how do we create more reliable systems? How do we create more equitable systems that serve all patients? And I won't go into a lot of my you know, clinical informatics research uh, and patient safety and the operating room. Um, but at the core of a lot of what I do is work in the standard space with the World Health Organization and the AMA and other groups to make sure that as we create systems, as we create technologies, and we adjust our delivery systems that they work for everybody. Uh, and creating standards that have that in mind is, is absolutely incredibly important from a foundation standpoint. So to best understand the AMA's work on health equity, it's important to know a little bit about how it fits into the larger strategic focus of the organization. And you can take all of the portfolio of the AMA, and it falls into pretty easy three categories. Getting rid of the obstacles that interfere with our ability to take care of patients, and there are a lot of them. Improving the health of the nation by leading the charge to prevent and reduce the incidence of chronic disease and confront health crises. And then driving the future of medicine by reimagining how we educate physicians, how we train in the health sciences, how we promote lifelong learning, how we promote innovations to tackle the biggest challenges in healthcare. And our work in, our work in health equity touches all three of those areas, but in different ways. And equity-centered work is a part of our state and federal advocacy efforts. It threads very neatly through all of our work in innovation, digital health and medical education, and it certainly is a centerpiece of our work to stem the tide of chronic disease with a special emphasis on hypertension and heart disease. Broadly speaking, the work of the AMA from our state and our federal work to our many programs and initiatives is all about supporting physicians so we can take better care of the nation and help build stronger, healthier, more vibrant communities. And the idea is a pretty straightforward one, that every human being is valuable, and that one person's life is valued as anyone others. That is at the heart and soul of our professional ethics. It is the basis for the creation of the AMA's code of medical ethics in the 19th century, the moral and ethical standards that still guide medical practice today. Sadly, as we all know too well, physicians around the world have at various dark periods in history failed to live up to that high moral ethical standard of the profession. And the U.S. in particular has a long and ugly history when it comes to race and gender inequities, when it comes to medical exploitation and experimentation, racism and discrimination, segregated and unequal access to health care, and other hardships that significantly contribute to the widening gaps in health outcomes for Black, Hispanic, indigenous, LGBTQ, and other historically marginalized communities, inequities that persist to today. Now the AMA has, in recent years, been on a journey of publicly uncovering and confronting our own history of racism and discrimination that has contributed to the health system that we have today in America. 
a system that is plagued by inequities and injustices that have harmed patients and systematically excluded so many from our physician ranks. It's the reason why the Mercy Douglas Hospital and other hospitals that came before it was so critically important to provide care, but also to train generations of aspiring physicians and nurses here in Philadelphia. And the AMA understands that there is so much to learn in exploring the painful truths and examining the past actions in the context of today. And aspiring physicians and professionals at every stage of their career benefit from a deeper and greater understanding of the cultural and political forces that contributed to the reprehensible acts of moral abandonment to serve as a racist ideology or atrocities committed under the guise of scientific advancement. And the AMA has begun this difficult work by not only recognizing our past moral failings and speaking very openly about them, but also by advancing policies that seek to correct those past wrongs, that influence the social determinants of health, that generate inequities in black and brown communities, and by educating physicians on why this work is necessary, is just, and is long overdue. And I, I will tell you, um, I had the humbling privilege two weeks ago of meeting with Dr. Charles Drew's daughter in Washington, Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis, um, who still has many of her father's papers. And in those papers are communications and correspondence with the AMA. And you can imagine the tenor and the response between Dr. Drew and the AMA at a time when the AMA was not making the right moral decisions for patients and physicians in the health of America. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to work with Dr. Drew's daughter to understand how we can learn from those mistakes in the past. We're engaged in this work because we believe it is right and we believe, we believe we can help guide the future by leveraging the power of our membership, our tremendous influence, our reach, we can help bring real and lasting change that is long overdue to medicine. And as AMA president, I believe that physicians and leaders in organized medicine are called to the moment, and that's why I am proud to talk about our evolution on these issues and the progress that we've made, as well as the difficult work that is ahead. It's long been known that health disparities among communities of people are directly linked to societal inequities, determinants of health, education, socioeconomic status, mobility, employment opportunities, transportation infrastructure, environmental quality, and of course, other factors. And these are why, big reason why, historically marginalized groups suffer higher rates of heart disease, diabetes, other chronic ailments. And those determinants of health, of course, at their root have racism and racist policies and practices. These and other determinants of health are contributing and driving stark health differences and outcomes for different communities. Black and Latinx communities suffer disproportionately high levels of chronic disease, especially heart disease. Black adults, 40% more likely than white adults to have high blood pressure, but less likely to have their blood pressure under control. Cardiovascular disease today killing nearly 50,000 black women annually in a preventable fashion. Nearly half of black women who are 20 and older have heart disease, but only one in five believes that she is personally at risk. Black communities suffer disproportionately high rates of cancer deaths, and these numbers underscore why Dr. Mitchell and so many others have dedicated their careers to trying to address 
health inequities, determinants of health at the root level, which has been the focus of the AMA as of late as well. There's also the alarming rate of maternal mortality. And a troubling statistic does not get the national attention that it deserves. Given the remarkable advancements that we have made across nearly every aspect of healthcare in the last quarter century, it is shocking that women in the US are more likely to suffer a pregnancy-related death today than they were in the 1990s. And the mortality rates for black women are far worse. Black women are three times more likely than white women to die from a pregnancy-related cause. Healthcare access challenges, underlying chronic conditions, structural racism, implicit bias, all contribute to these bleak statistics. Our nation suffers a higher rate of maternal mortality than any other well-resourced nation in the world. And what's most disturbing is a significant majority, a significant majority of pregnancy-related deaths in our nation are totally preventable. This is an American tragedy that we simply have to partner together to address. So, what is the AMA doing? about those very alarming statistics to advance more equitable care access across medicine. Our policy, which is democratically decided by our House of Delegates, broadly defines health equity as optimal health for everybody. But it also recognizes racism is still a major public health threat and importantly recognizes that race is a social, not a biological construct. And so our policy calls on us to use our power and our influence to achieve greater health equity in a variety of ways, through advocacy, through promoting equity in care, through trying to expand workforce diversity, influencing those determinants of health, and modeling a commitment to health equity for others. Many of you know that the AMA in 2019 created our Center for Health Equity with Dr. Alita Maybank, who we recruited from the University of Department of Public Health, an incredible transformational leader um, who has brought forward a strategy to facilitate and strengthen all of our work to eliminate health disparities. The center actively works to dismantle racist and discriminatory practices as well as to try to remove the most common barriers that are continuing to keep historically marginalized communities from getting the care that they need. The center has been the driving force for most of our work around racial justice and equity, and they have done some incredible things. We launched a medical justice and advocacy fellowship program. We just graduated our latest cohort of 11 fellows. It's a 15-month program that brings together individuals from across the country to work on anti-racist, equity-focused, patient-centered projects specific to the communities where the fellows come from. And that fellowship, which we launched during the pandemic, is in partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine. Our Release the Pressure National Public Health Campaign in partnership with Essence has provided black women all across the country with critical resources to identify and track their blood pressure, develop a wellness plan, and get it connected to resources to take control of their heart health. All of that work built on previous AMA investments in trying to reduce hypertension, including our MAP and BP initiative, which is an evidence-based quality improvement program. In Cook County in Illinois, which includes Chicago, our hometown and our corporate headquarters, uh, we incorporated a pilot program in 2020 to improve overall blood pressure control rates, which was about 40% in Cook County. And through that program, Cook County Health um, was able to improve blood pressure control rates by 13% in an initial cohort of marginalized patients on the west side of the city. And to date, we've now worked with 46 healthcare organizations across the country in 20 different states to scale that initiative, focusing on underserved communities. 
We also have our Rise to Health Coalition last spring, which we launched first of its kind initiative to bring together leading healthcare organizations, including the Institute for Health Improvement, Race Forward, to create a shared framework to advance health equity at scale across the US. We also have our West Side United Partnership back in our hometown of Chicago, a $5 million commitment to a nonprofit collaborative to do place-based investments to improve economic vitality in places around the west side of the city that have been devastated by years of neglect and underinvestment because of redlining. Now, the center was founded, and then three years later, we released an important strategic plan in 2021, a very ambitious multi-year strategy outlining five critical approaches to tackle this work. The first is to embed equity and racial justice throughout everything that we do. The second is to build alliances with marginalized positions and other stakeholders. The third is to push upstream to address those social determinants and the root causes of inequalities. The fourth is to ensure equitable structures and opportunities for innovation. And then finally, fostering truth, racial healing, and reconciliation. And to advance the last pillar of that work, we have established a Truth, Reconciliation, Healing, and Transformation Task Force to further explore the AMA's past and make recommendations to the AMA on future efforts and more to come in the years ahead about the task force and its important work. Another important piece is, of course, educating trainees, physicians in practice, other healthcare workers, on the issues and the research that explains why these inequities exist and how do we bridge those gaps. The kind of information that too many people just do not learn in medical school or their training programs. So we have a groundbreaking series of CME modules that is all free on our education hub to better train people on the root causes of health inequities, including racism and structural determinants of health. In 2022, we teamed up with the Association of American Medical Colleges to create a toolkit called A Guide for Language, Narrative, and Concepts that provides guidance on equity-focused person-first language and why words matter. We've also produced three dozen episodes for our CME accredited Prioritizing Equity video series. Um, it's great to watch, and I would highly encourage you to check it out looking at how determinants of health are uniquely impacting marginalized communities, public health, and health equity. Uh, we also have a National Health Equity Grand Rounds series that we launched uh, just last year uh, that's also available online. Now, of course, our health equity strategy is shaping all of our state and federal work as well. We're working to address the crisis of maternal mortality and improve family health in a variety of ways. A long list of what's on the slide, I'll just highlight a couple. One is, not every state has expanded Medicaid chip coverage to 12 months postpartum, which leaves a huge gap for many families and moms who have just delivered when they suddenly no longer have access to healthcare. We know that this is an evidence-based approach that works, that saves the health system money, and yet it has not happened in every state. We continue to try to expand mental health parity, especially for postpartum women at risk for postpartum depression, uh, and increase a variety of things related to diversity and workforce. Uh, and we're particularly concerned about the ongoing closure of maternal units in rural and urban communities, including uh, one announced just two weeks ago in my home state in Wisconsin that we're trying to help reverse. Now, of course, um, there's also an important health equity component to our ongoing work to build trust. Trust in science, trust in medicine, trust in medical institutions, an issue that took on increased importance during the pandemic. And there's little chance to improve any of those alarming health statistics I've highlighted if patients don't trust the health information they're receiving. And that starts with improving access to care in underserved communities and building relationships with communities that have been neglected for too long. And when you consider our nation's dark history, 
of exclusion, of experimentation on black and brown communities, it's understandable why many would mistrust the advice of physicians, of healthcare institutions. But we cannot let that be a barrier to building these relationships moving forward. That's one piece to the puzzle. Another is ensuring that people understand the prevalence of medical misinformation and disinformation that is so overwhelming online. Medical misinformation, a lot of it politically driven, some of it from our licensed colleagues, for any number of reasons, spiked during the pandemic and continues to create confusion, distrust among patients, and it has contributed to hostility and threats both online sometimes a person directed at physicians, nurses, and other medical workers. Some of you know that the AMA got its start in the mid-19th century in an environment that's not that different than the one we face today. And one of our most important roles was identifying and stamping out snake oil and quack remedies that endangered public health and greatly undermined the institution of medicine, including trust in physicians. That is still now one of our most important roles that we play today, as we have seen a surge in hostility directed at science and scientists since the earliest days of the pandemic. The rhetoric, whether it's online or coming out of the mouth of a politician on a podium at a rally, has consequences. It has serious consequences on patient health. This was true throughout the pandemic, and pushing back on outrageous claims about unproven treatments like ivermectin in support of vaccine efficacy, and we have to be sure that we push back today. This has, unfortunately, led to a profound loss of trust in experts, doctors, scientists, medical institutions, and it's hard to help patients make informed decisions about their own health because of it. It's my view that as physicians and as physician leaders, we have an obligation to push back on medical misinformation and always to stand up for science and for evidence. And we have to hold our colleagues accountable when they are deliberately spreading falsehoods online. And the AMA has been working with state licensing boards to that effect, amongst other things. We've got to partner with each other and make sure that we continue to call out the media and ask for their support. Now, the AMA is also working, and we have to work, in creative ways to increase diversity in our physician community. And we do this through scholarship assistance, pathway programs, our work in the federal courts to protect immigrant physicians and medical students. We know from the research and from experience the importance of diverse physician workforce to increasingly care for diverse communities. And unfortunately, the US Supreme Court ruling last year that ended affirmative action is going to have a significant impact on medical education and diversity in medicine. We joined side by side with 40 other organizations in an amicus brief at the Supreme Court that urged the Supreme Court to take no action that would disrupt admissions processes in the nation's health profession schools, admissions processes that had been very carefully crafted uh, in reliance on the court's long-standing precedents. That amicus brief was cited by the dissenting justices in their comments on the case, and we believe that policies that permit race as a component of selection are critical, critical to diversifying the healthcare workforce. A physician workforce that reflects the diversity of our nation is a critically important piece to eliminating health inequities. And we have to continue to push forward in spite of the unfortunate Supreme Court decision. So we have through our foundation, the AMA Foundation, a, a scholarship program. We know that the average medical school debt is a daunting barrier to many who want to come into medical school. Um, we have some creative initiatives underway with a consortium of 37 schools trying to accelerate change in medical education. This includes having medical schools incorporate curriculum so that young physicians, aspiring physicians, better understand social determinants of health 
And we're scaling that work increasingly across more and more UME and GME training programs. We've got our doctors back to school programs, which encourages children from minoritized communities to consider pursuing careers in medicine, uh, and obviously a lot of work at the federal courts. We're very fortunate to have the AMA Minority Affairs section that continues to give voice and be an important advocate for issues that directly impact minority physicians and medical students. And uh, Dr. Mitchell was a force of nature in driving the work and the advocacy of the learning affairs sections for many years. And she has left a big gap for us to fill as we think about what's ahead. We also have a very active advisory committee on LGBTQ health issues that does work trying to, again, protect patients in the courts, work with the executive uh, branch of the government to try to get rulemaking that provides anti-discrimination protections, and obviously our work around uh, the legislative uh, branch across uh, the nation. As I come to the um, close of my talk, let me um, talk a little bit about innovation and health technology. And um, I want to talk about what it means to design technology with an equity lens and why it matters. And the AMA has a number of efforts underway to ensure that bias is not embedded in the design and creation of new digital technologies. Does anybody think we're not in an AI era? <laughs> Nobody, okay, so I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, we were reminded as we think about new technologies and bias during COVID of how critical this is. Pulse oximeters. I'm an anesthesiologist. I would never take a patient to the operating room without a pulse oximeter. And yet we learned during COVID because of work out of the years of Michigan that they are poorly calibrated in people of color. And they do not work well if you have dark skin. And they overestimate your oxygen saturation if you have dark skin. And this led to people not getting oxygen. It led to people of color not getting ICU care because of a calibration problem. And the shocking thing isn't the calibration issue itself. The shocking thing is we've known about this for 30 years. It is well documented. You can go and you can find it in the literature. You can find it in comments to the FDA. And nobody thought it was important enough to matter until now. So we're going to fix this. And I've been deeply engaged with the FDA on this issue. They've had a series of meetings and open sessions trying to look at labeling issues, testing requirements. Um, and if you want to see this, the, um, uh, about six months ago, one of the flagship AMC journals will send anybody the reference. Um, these studies are hard to do, but they did it. They did a study. They took healthy volunteers. They put arterial catheters in them. They took blood samples. They made the volunteers hypoxic, and they checked the pulse ox. And guess what? The stuff you buy off the shelf from the brand name companies that you know, they do not work. The best stuff. So we have to fix this. We need to do better. We need to do better, which is why our Info Health Initiative was created. This we launched in partnership with 14 other collaborator organizations, all committed to strengthen and amplify and integrate principles into work at the intersection of health, equity, and innovation. And we need to make sure that we have invested in health innovations from and for historically marginalized communities. And this is basically a roadmap to figure out how we can do that by engaging with industry. We also have a very effective external equity and innovation advisory group to ensure that we are engaging in the digital health space with an equity perspective. And this is a group that has been foundational in driving a lot of our work. And finally, we all know about data and how important data is to achieve greater health equity. And we have made influencing the social determinants of health an uh, important part of our larger work to advance health outcomes through policies, programs, and digital health. Um, but we all know that we often don't have the data to help us make the right decisions. So we are a founding partner of the Gravity Project. This is a national public-private partnership 
launched in 2019 to develop the consensus-driven standards to support the collection and the use and exchange of social determinants of health data. So when I was in medical school, nobody was talking about how do you routinely collect this data. Now, people are starting to ask questions about food insecurity. Do you have a refrigerator to store your medicine? Do you have a place to sleep at night? But there's no electronic health record to store it. So it's a free text note, buried away, hidden and unusable, and unable to be acted on by decision support and other tools. The Gravity Project is all about solving an issue by making sure that we have consensus-driven standards to ensure that we're able to collect data in a way that can make it actionable. So, I've covered a lot. Um, I think I'm slightly over my time. It's always dangerous to give a leader a microphone and ruin the clock. Um, but let me end by thanking you for the opportunity to be here tonight um, to talk about the way that the AMA, in partnership with so many others, is working to advance equity and justice in medicine. This is a long process, but it is a process that we are committed to, committed to for the long haul. And um, the AMA is not a pioneer in this work. We're not. Um, incredible physicians like Dr. Mitchell uh, and so many others have built the foundation that we are standing on to try to raise awareness of these issues and eliminate long-standing equities and injustices and improve health outcomes. That's what this work is all about, and I am so honored to have been invited to, to discuss it with you. And um, I spent 10 years in the Navy and uh, in the Navy, you know, you know, Dr. Mitchell was Army, and I still forgive her for that. Um, but we have a phrase and a saying that does hold true across the services. And um, Dr. Mitchell, I know you're up there smiling down on us tonight, and we have to watch. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very informative, insightful, reflective talk. So um, we want to now move into the exciting and exciting portion of this program. I'm always so excited um, for this myself. I want to bring forward the Vice President of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. William King and Dr. Judith Alton, who assisted in the scholarship selection committee process for the presentation of the Magruder Knox Scholarship Awards. Judith and I are so excited to be doing the, uh, the money part of the program. <laughs> this is the best part, and we are thrilled with this, uh, this, this uh, opportunity. There were, there were 24 applicants you know, from all around the city that applied for these scholarships this year. That's really a significant number. And the reason is there's usually more, we, we're training usually in Philadelphia more than 100 physicians, African Americans, and members of the African diaspora a year, every year coming into Philly for um, in med school training. So between five medical centers, it's um, it often, many years, is more than Howard in D.C. trains. It's more than Atlanta sometimes. It's more, definitely more than, than uh, Charles Drew in, in the West Coast trains. So Philadelphia is not just um, the best city, of course. <laughs> but uh, we also train the most uh, black doctors. So that makes us. <laughs> And we have this very well organized. I was watching the Grammys this year. So I'm all already about doing this right. So um, what we wanted to just um, mention uh, briefly, though, is, is what is Magruder Knox about? What are the scholarships? So we did want to let you know about Dr. Sandra McGruder and Dr. David Knox. So uh, 
Dr. Halvin, are you, are you ready to talk about uh, Dr. Magruder? And then uh, we're going to be switching back and forth like they do on the Just like they do on the <laughs> Good evening. So we're going to just briefly tell you about Dr. Sandra Magruder Jackson. Uh, she practiced medicine in Philadelphia for more than 20 years. She was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the eldest of four children. After graduating from Westinghouse High School, Dr. Magruder Jackson matriculated at Lincoln University here in Pennsylvania. She graduated from Lincoln Magna Cum Laude uh, with great honor with a BS degree in biology. She began her training at Jefferson University School of Medicine after graduation from college and completed her training at the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Dr. Magruder Jackson completed her residency training in internal medicine at Albert Einstein Medical Center. Through her private practice, holistic health care, she promoted traditional and non-traditional therapies, including alternative and complementary approaches. In addition to her own practice, Holistic Healthcare, she, I'm sorry, in addition to her own practice, Dr. Magruder Jackson provided administrative leadership at several facilities. She served as medical director at a community health center and the Healthcare for the Homeless Project. She was the clinical coordinator for an ambulatory outpatient clinic and served as project physician for residential and outpatient substance abuse programs. In addition to advocating for consumers, Dr. Magruder Jackson was a board member and former president of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia arm of the National Medical Association. Dr. Magruder Jackson was an integral part of the Medical Society of Pennsylvania, or as we call it, MSEP, and hosted MSEP's monthly radio program uh, called Physicians on Air on the radio station WURD uh, 900 AM that we currently still to this day um, have, uh, I think it's every third Sunday, Sunday. every third Sunday, and 900 AM, 900 AM, and that goes international. So if you want to listen in, Dr. Magruder Jackson was listed in the Outstanding Women in America and Who's Who among American colleges and universities. As well, Dr. Magruder Jackson became the first female graduate to receive Lincoln University's Outstanding Alumna Award. Yeah, um, Dr. Magruder made me uh, join the MSCP officer corps. She forced me to, and Dr. Mitchell also forced uh, all of us to join. So all the officers, I think we, we all are here because of either Dr. Magruder or Dr. Mitchell uh, telling us we have to do it, and we said, I don't think that's how medicine works. No, you didn't have to do it. So that's why we're all here. So we're excited, uh, and in case uh, you Magruder not scholars didn't know that you have a lifetime of service ahead of you, you have to do it. Like Mitchell says, you have to do it. It's not just about the money. Um, David Knox, you know, is the other doc who was just uh, was, it was a real force in terms of these medical student scholarships. They've been around, we think, since 1999. Um, and it's, it, but, they, but they've uh, been around a long time, and, and David Knox and Sandra Magruder were really a force to say, no, we need to give these medical students some, um, some honor and give them some money. Um, you know, uh, Dolores Knox, uh, her, his uh, spouse, um, wanted to be here, and she sends her uh, blessings to us um, as we Continue to uh, honor them, and uh, he was a you know I just David Knox you know he was he's a he was a cardiologist and internist he was uh, a graduate of Roman Catholic here in Philly he was a alumnus of uh, Lincoln University <coughs> like my dad was he was a Omega Psi pilot like my dad was mm -hmm. um, which is why he's a force now you know there's other fraternities sororities here there's all five, the, the Divine Nine right so I hear you back there. <laughs> Hershey Medical School graduate, the first African American fellow of the American College of Cardiology, and uh, practiced a long time, you know, in uh, North Philadelphia Health System, um, Einstein, Hahnemann, and Gerard Medical Center. He was eight years president of MSCP and a long time MMA member. So, um, those two are the reason you guys are getting these awards. And uh, the first award, 
goes to. Uh -oh. Am I in charge of this? Our first award goes to Ms. Yvette Yueka. She's a second no. year. She's a rising third year in a dual degree MD master's program in urban bioethics at Temple University, uh, Lewis Katz School of Medicine. Originally from Queens, New York, she completed her undergraduate education at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, majoring in chemistry with other minors, uh, including Africana studies. She returned to New York City and um, was engaged in population health research with the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Um, she has participated in Philadelphia very, very much in terms of uh, community service uh, to um, North uh, Philadelphia communities working on health disparities. Uh, she has served as the SNMA president from uh, the Student National Medical Association from 2022 to 2023. Um, she also played a pivotal role in supporting black medical students and organizing the 2023 Region uh, 8 Medical Educational Conference. Uh, in her free time, she enjoys cooking, doing yoga, and attending Afrobeat dance classes. Congratulations. We just want the awardees to know that the check is behind the certificate. <laughs> Do not throw away the certificate to get to the check. These certificates are very fancy. Our next awardee. Bryce in Houston. Um, he's 30 minutes in. <laughs> at, at the University of Pennsylvania Berman School of Medicine, graduate of Morehouse College, originally from Dallas, Texas. Um, came, to, came to Philly, of course, because he had to leave Dallas, we understand that. And uh, was involved in the Perlman Access to Summer Program, which is called the PASS Program, which kind of brought him into medical school. Um, during, during the height of COVID, getting involved in some local public health research, he um, got ready to do his medical school journey. He um, has been involved as a med student in the Hingston Holloway program that's here, right here, so that we're really um, happy to see that connection with the College of Physicians. Philly Student Doctors, um, which is a, another a student group bringing together doctors and dentists and lots of uh, health students from around the city. Um, he, he's involved in a lot of athletic events like the Broad Street Run and Philly uh, Love Run because of his interest in orthopedic surgery. Um, and uh, from the Bible, he, uh, he what's carried him through, the journey, through his journey, Philippians 4.13, one of my son's favorite too. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, right. <laughs> is Khalil Taylor, a third year, from Drexel University College of Medicine. <laughs> Khalil is a rising fourth year medical student at Drexel University College of Medicine. He's a Philadelphia native and received his bachelor's degree from Villanova in biology and psychology and his master's in interdisciplinary health sciences from Drexel. He's currently doing his rotations in pediatrics at St. Christopher's Hospital and has done other rotations uh, at Crozier Hospital in Chester. He previously was a meditation instructor for his medical school's yoga club, uh, co-president for Integrative Medicine Interest Group, and tutor and internal coordinator for the RISE program here in Philadelphia. Before medical school, he worked as a project manager for culturally responsive healing practices uh, at Drexel Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. He plans on pursuing a career in emergency medicine and advocacy for urban and underserved communities. Congratulations, Khalil. Our next recipient is Kevin Hunter, a third year from 
Thomas Jefferson University City of Kimmel. Uh, Nicole is a second year medical student. Um, she cannot win next year, though. This is her win. <laughs> at, at Sydney Kimmel Medical College, Thomas Jefferson. She was born and raised here in Philadelphia, graduated from Tulane University in New Orleans uh, with her uh, Bachelor of Science in Business Management. Uh, she worked um, in business um, with CBS and Peloton and, uh, and realized she had to get into medicine. So I uh, went to uh, George Washington University's back, baccalaureate program and, uh, and since coming to medical school, um, she was, has been the chair of the community service uh, chair for the Jefferson SMA. She um, has been uh, really, really happy to see her involved with our MSCP activity as a MCAT prep mentor. So that's an exciting um, new connection that we have. That's my sister on my plane. <laughs> and she's going to be do, um, getting involved in some summer research with the radiation, radiation oncology here at Jefferson. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, would appreciate that and say, do your best. So thank you. Our next recipient is Kayla Davenport, a third year at PCOM or Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. <laughs> Kayla is currently a third year medical student at PCOM, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine here in Philadelphia. Uh, she was raised in New Jersey. Um, she spent the first a uh, few years of her adolescence, she states in the foster care system uh, with her twin sister and younger brother. Uh, she was adopted along with her siblings, all three of them, by her parents, Blondie and Kevin Davenport. Um, <laughs> um, she began her medical journey at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Uh, and received a degree in kinesiology and health. Uh, she continued her journey at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University and enrolled in a post bac program. And at that time, in 2021, was admitted to PCOM. Uh, she then has, since then, has held on to many different uh, electronic uh, board positions, including class chair, student ambassador, and an anatomy uh, TA, which is a teaching assistant. Um, she wants to uh, continue her service to the community, uh, has been active in the Philadelphia area in community service, uh, and uh, we're very proud to give her this degree. She has a dual certified, e she's in, interested in being a dual certified emergency medicine, internal medicine physician. Now, um, those are the Magruder Knox scholarships, like, um, you know, just like when winning uh, Emmys or Grammys, there's one from each school. Um, but but um, there's, there's so many excellent medical students in the, in, in the city that the committee, we, we came to the officers and we said, we gotta give us some more awards. There's just, there's just a few more students that we're, we just really can't stand to not be able to um, bring up here. So. The next one is, this is our MSCP commendation. And, uh, and this is uh, Amy Turner. <laughs> Amy from uh, Temple University, the uh, Lewis Katz School of Medicine. And she is a uh, third year, um, another uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. Resident and with a focus on women's health, she's um, she's very involved in, in exercise again, um, spin class and Pilates and, and uh, restaurant scene, which uh, the spin classes and Pilates helps with. Um, and she's getting uh, she's very excited to be pursuing OBGYN pro um, gynecology residencies in the coming year. And uh, we just we just were impressed with the with the other service and involvement she's had um, while she was at Temple. So thank you.
Our next recipient for accommodation award is Kinichuku Charles Obi. We, we know that two students um, were not able to attend. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. He, just to give you, <laughs> we're going to give him his award later. We'll, we'll watch Dr. King and make sure that award gets to him. <laughs> so, Kenny Chukum is a third year medical student uh, attending Drexel University School of Medicine. Um, he attended the University of Pittsburgh and went on to obtain an undergraduate degree in neuroscience with a minor in chemistry. He then went on to complete Drexel's um, program to get into medical school and at this point is very active in the community, president of the Drexel Black Doctor Network, vice president of Drexel's branch of RISE Philly, an organization geared towards tutoring kids in the Philadelphia region, uh, ages K through 12. He's currently doing research on health disparities in the field of oncology. In his free time, uh, Kenichuku, or KC as he's also called, likes to play soccer and cur currently coaches a U11 soccer team. Uh, in the future, he plans to pursue a career in ENT or ear, nose, and throat. That's uh, Kenny right there. And, and finally, Obahoye Isisele. Um, it, she's also not here tonight. Right, okay. So um, she is also getting accommodations um, from Thomas Jefferson, and so these will be both available. Um, your deans at, at Thomas Jefferson and at Drexel will have your checks. So it's <laughs> for not here. And uh, she's a third year medical student. Uh, she was uh, at Rutgers. She was raised in, born and raised in New Jersey, interested in general surgery. And um, the thing that's uh, obviously very impressive about what she's done is she was the, she's one of the co-presidents of Jeff, Jeff Hope. Anybody who knows Jefferson knows that is a huge um, um, activity. And so um, her, her work and efforts there is, uh, is enough um, for that. So we just wanted to say for OBE that we're happy to also give her a commendation. Congratulations to all of our scholars. Um, and thank you to all of those who have contributed to our fundraising efforts. We really have, over the last couple of years, worked very hard so that um, we can be more generous with our scholarship awards and to expand on the programs, particularly those pipeline programs that all of us thought we're very excited about. And I want to recognize our fundraising chair and our financial secretary, Dr. Linda Thomas Mayvine. She likes to say she's not too proud of it. <laughs> so um, that brings our program to a close. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our hosts again for this beautiful space, for the financial support for the program itself, and for our illustrious speaker, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld. I invite you all to stay tuned for, um, keep your eyes peeled. I, hopefully you all are on our um, email list. We plan to do the second iteration of our Black Philly Med Grant wish list. This year we're planning to flip it to invite those graduating students who are coming to Philadelphia to sign up with us and um, we would like to welcome them into the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania. We noticed with our uh, great medical students last year, so many of them left and that didn't really um, meet our goal as a local society. So what we are hoping to do is to celebrate those graduates who are going to be coming to serve in Philadelphia, and hopefully we'll make Philadelphia their home. So thank you all. We have a reception. I know we're, I'm sure we're over time, so. <laughs> Oh yes, with the uh, nurses who have joined us today, all those who are here with us to celebrate the history of the Mercy Douglas Hospital and Training School, <laughs> um, particularly those 
who served at Mercy Douglas Hospital. Will you stand or raise your hand? Thank you so much for your many years of dedicated service to the uh, city of Philadelphia. With that, that brings our program to a close. Thank you.